Welcome to Ira's Everything Bagel, where I talk with intriguing people about everything, their passions, pursuits, and points of view. Some people have a passion for food, others for art, and still others for travel. My guest's passion is travel, specifically cruising, and the story behind his joy is fascinating. He's Gary Bembridge. He's host of Tips for Travelers, Incredible Cruise Experiences Made Easy, available on his YouTube channel, blog, and podcast. For everything about Gary, go to tipsfortravelers.com, and you can follow him on YouTube, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and Pinterest. And Gary, welcome to the show. Hi, thanks for having me, Ira. Absolutely. You have an interesting background, which eventually led you to cruising. So tell us a little bit about your career in global marketing, your health issues, your decision to regularly cruise. Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, as you said, my background is marketing. I used to work for Johnson & Johnson. And so I had this kind of global job and I'm a bit of a geek. So I like technology. So when <laughs> podcasting started and YouTube started, I was all very excited about that. And I was traveling enormously, like I would be away two, three weeks, uh, you know, a month was ahead. You know, I was working with all different countries around the world. And so what I wanted to do is you never knew whether you're going back to a place or not. So I'd research it like crazy before I went, um, knew exactly what I wanted to do, do it because I'd go, you know, the day before or had a weekend. And I thought, well, I've got all this content that I've researched and tried out. So so now I'll try this podcasting thing. And then um, so I did that when that started. And then YouTube started, I think, 2006. And I started actually sort of videoing hotel rooms and just experimenting and playing around. Um, and then they started doing well. And then I picked, then I went on my first cruise in 2004, I think it was, um, when I was actually invited to go and talk on a cruise, but it was a specific marketing conference. So before then, I'd been like most people, why would I go on a cruise? It's only for old people. It's going to be boring. I'm going to feel trapped. All those usual things that people think. <laughs> and I went on the cruise as a speaker on this marketing conference because they chartered the ship. And as we sailed out, it's like, I get it now. I realized the magic of being at sea and everything. So I'd started doing more cruising. I, I started posting it on YouTube. They did well. And I'd always decided that I was going to retire when I was 55. I decided that when I was 30, actually. So I'd kind of worked towards that. Then, um, as you were alluding, just before that time, then I, I got diagnosed with cancer. And I had chemo and stuff. So I retired at that same sort of time. Anyway, luckily, I got into remission. And so I started focusing a bit more uh, on the, the the YouTube specifically, and YouTube partly because I enjoyed. I realized when I went on a trip, I'd make the videos first, then do the podcast, then do the blogs. So I thought, okay, you like making the videos, but then also I thought, well, actually, the easiest place also to make money, if you want to make money out of all the time you're putting in, is YouTube. It's a bit easier than I mean, it's much easier now on podcasting than it was before. So I sort of focused there, applied more of my marketing stuff, did more cruising, and I just kind of took off from there. It kind of exploded, literally, from there. Well, you're very modest, Gary, because I forget the exact figure I saw the other day, but it's millions upon millions of views on YouTube. Do you have yeah, a I've, current figure for us? Yeah, I do. So all-time views is 117 million. But I get, um, you know, around 3 million views a month, which is mind-boggling. Um, so like the last four or five months, it's been 3 million. I think last month it was 3.2 million views and I have 350,000 subscribers, but on YouTube, it's the views that are important. You know, the subscribers are great, but it's the views that really count. So that's very exciting. Um, and it's sort of no mind boggling when it. I look at the numbers and think, oh my God, <laughs> the 3 million of my videos we watched this month alone. It's like, it's hard to get your head around at times. Do you ever consider yourself a celebrity because of the numbers of viewers that watch all of your product? Well, it's interesting. I, I don't, but I realize one interesting story is I, I was on a cruise last year, a princess cruise, and I I I, I booked a suite on this one. So you ate in a in one a separate restaurant, that little restaurant you'd eat, have breakfast at, you know, in the restaurant, in the main restaurant. And the waitress came up to the one day and she said, "Are you famous?" <laughs> when you come in every morning, people look at you and they, they start talking about you, and it's like, "Who? What?" And it's like, "No, I'm not. It's just a lot of people on cruises." know me because they watch my videos but right. what people do now yeah. is they come and talk to me more because i've said like please come and talk to me if you're on a cruise because i want to know who the people are you know obviously youtube give you lots of data but it's the people i want to meet so and that's very exciting because then you get to meet the people so you know this exciting sort of like um on some cruises you know like the last cruise i was on 
my two cabin stewards watched the channel and they were so excited. <laughs> like, Can I be on the video? Can I be on the video? And it's quite good actually, because actually I, I found it, you know, videoing and people is always a tricky one. You know, how do you video and, and, and stuff? But now it's great because lots of people want to be in my video. They, they'll say to me, make sure I'm in the video. <laughs> do you ever hear from, uh, well, I don't know what you'd call it on a cruise ship, but upper management, I guess the captain and some the hotel director and those kind of people, do, do they come up to you unsolicited and say, we know who you are, we see your videos? Yeah, quite quite we often. Um, uh, you know, quite <laughs> often a lot of um, a lot of uh, the crew, particularly the hotel director, that sort of side of the, of, of the business right. too. And also a lot of crew... Are what I discovered discovered me during the pandemic, because obviously they were all laid off. You know, it's all contracts, so they they didn't they were just basically they they had a contract and they had no work, and so they didn't have a connection with the cruise line directly. So they weren't getting information, and during the pandemic, because people were not really wanting to watch travel so much, but the, people were very interested in news. So I was doing lots every week. I'd do a news report around what's happening with opening, not reopening. So a huge amount of crews started watching me then because they were looking for information. And so a lot of them know me from that and they've kept kept right. going. But yeah, like you know, on the last cruise, the hotel director phoned me to say, I see you on board, uh, love your channel. Kind of <laughs> stuff. So that's, that's, that's fun. Well, yeah. what's nice about your channel, and I've watched it, is that you are objective. You're not uh, playing favorites or unfavorites. You're telling it like it is. And people may think that you get freebie cruises because of your popularity but in fact you pay your own way and you only do ship inspection and other kind of maiden voyage shakedown type of cruises where everybody's invited to participate so you're not you're not getting any favorites from any of the cruise lines yeah i mean that's it's interesting i mean when i when i first sort of really focused on the channel so 2018 or so i i, I got very excited because i started getting asked by cruise lines but then i thought actually that's is, is not the way to do it because actually i want my real uh, employer if you like to be the viewer and i figured out if i could drive the channel and get enough views i would be able to pay my own way so i i made a conscious decision back in 2019 that i would only pay for my own cruises so i pay for my own cruises now well i don't pay the viewers pay obviously because it's <laughs> from the it's from the revenue but sure. i do get invited a lot by cruise lines i think last year i was invited like 11 times and i said no to all of those because i want to because i feel you know, there's always, I feel there's a contract, even if it's an unspoken contract, you know, cruise lines don't send people on a cruise because they want, you know, they send you because they want right. a good report. Right, so, exactly. So, so and I found, you know, I found, so I just, I prefer that. I mean, lots of other people, you know, there's also rules around declaration and stuff. So people have to declare, but so you're right. What I do now is if I'm invited on a ship visit, you know, like if, um, you know, like in the shipyard, is being built or right. if it's a shakedown cruise i will go on those you know because they run shakedown cruises before they do fair paying passengers because that's a great way to see the ship and get lots of footage of the ship but also you i never really make videos about it because it's full of travel agents ship uh, employees and journalists so it's not you're never going to get a true representation of the cruise anyway right. but it's quite right. good you know you can at least see the ship before it comes out and get a sense of and you're getting b-roll for future material exactly yeah, no, yeah. no, that makes perfect sense. Yeah. I want to get into some tips from the expert, but before even that, well, do you remember what your most joyful cruise was? I always say to people, it's the last one. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's, 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 it, that's always a hard question to answer. I mean, the, the most special cruise in, way, in the way that I probably was the most happiest was the first time I went to Antarctica because... Um, you know, I had expected it to be amazing. I mean, obviously, it's very expensive to go. So, you you know, it's high risk in, in that perspective. But actually going there and thinking, I mean, literally, I remember walking on the deck just smiling. I mean, people thought I was a bit mad. But um, <laughs> thinking, this is even better than the best documentary I've ever watched, just being there. Th that was the happiest, the most incredible, you know, time of, of any cruise. Has, has, that's probably been the most... Um, the, the happiest of, of all um, of them, just because it, it was just so, such an incredible experience. How about the opposite end, the most disappointing cruise? The most disappointing cruise that I've been, I've only, you know, I've, I've done, I've literally just finished my hundredth cruise. So I've, I've been on a lot of cruises. I mean, some are shorter, wow. some are long. You but average about 10 a year, right? Yes. Yeah. Roughly what sort of 10 to 12 months. Yeah. Yeah. So, 
the, the most disappointing was when I went on um, Costa Cruises and it was sort of early on in my cruising journey when I hadn't really thought a lot about what's important on a cruise ship. So I just booked like a guaranteed cabin and whatever. And I got this Ocean View cabin uh, and I, realized I just didn't enjoy it. And also I was, there was only, you know, the ship probably had two and a half thousand people. There were maybe 10, and uh, there's only 10 passengers who spoke English. So I felt very kind of alien there and I wasn't ready for that. So, um, you know, I've since been on ships where I've been maybe only one or two English speakers on like a river cruise, but now I'm used to it, I'm prepared for it and stuff. So that was my most disappointing cruise. I got the cabin wrong, I chose the wrong cruise line. I didn't feel like, I didn't feel included kind of stuff. So I think that was probably the one. Everybody has their own version of what a great cruise is or what a great cruise line is or what a great cruise ship is. And if I could pick your brain and just tell us what you see, what you see as the top three things that could make or break a cruise, and then is it really reliant on a particular ship or cruise line, or is it? Are there other factors that are more important than whether it's a specific cruise line or a ship? I would say the most important thing of all is that point that you made: is choosing the right cruise line is absolutely critical. And then also linked to that is sort of the ship because there's, there's a variety of ships within cruise lines as well. But but I think the mistake most people make is they think I'm going to go on a cruise. So they look for a cruise and they go on a cruise. But it, cruise lines, you know, there is, there's a, it's slightly cliche, but there is a cruise line for everybody. They are very, very different. So, you know, you need to really understand what it is that's important to you on a vacation. So if you're a party animal and want to party, but want to wear shorts all the time doing it, you know, you've got to get on a cruise line where you can do that. If you, you know, hate, you really don't want to be surrounded by kids and you like boring dancing and, you know, kind of intellectual lectures and stuff, there's a cruise line that for doing that. So really kind of breaking down what's important to you is absolutely critical. That's the first thing. The second thing is most people make the mistake of saying the cabins aren't important. All I do is eat and sleep, uh, sorry, uh, uh, change and sleep in it. Yeah. <laughs> and people only say that until they have a bad cabin, which can ruin your cruise. So um, I, I, you know, getting the cabin right is really important. You know, again, if you're a party animal, the cabin might be important because you want no noise during the day when you're sleeping or whatever. Um, but it's, it's really important. So I always have a little rule, which is um, I always book a cabin where I can choose the cabin and I make sure it's got cabins on either side of me with no interconnecting door cabin above me, cabin below me, and ideally a cabin opposite, because then you're likely to be buffered, you know, from busy venues, noisy venues, the nightclub. And I get hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of, you know, comments saying, I didn't believe you that a cabin wasn't important until like, <laughs> exactly. I discovered I was above the nightclub on Virgin Voyages and the nightclub goes until 4 a.m. Or, or whatever. Um, how do you, though, so that, Gary, how can you find, this is the one that intrigued me because I've watched so many of your videos. How can you find out whether your cabin has a connecting door or not? Is that available on the ship's website? Yeah, it's very easy. It's very easy. I mean, basically, I mean, in the olden days, it was in the brochure or some lines from the brochure. But if you just go online um, and you, you go for the ship and look for the deck plan and they all are marked normally just with a little sort of line with little arrows on the side, they either do pointing you know, horizontally or vertically. Um, or, or there's always a little indicator that that they're inter interconnected. Um, Good to know. Uh, or if you work with a travel agent, then you just say to the travel, I want a cabin with no interconnected door, and obviously they'll do it for you. But but um, th th it's always marked, yeah. Something you point out also in that people look for, some people look for the low price, the low initial price of a cruise and maybe a special going on or a sale going on. And then there's, as you refer to it, and I agree, the nickel and diming that can happen if you go that way. And I'd rather pay more as an inclusive so that I don't have to think about all that and worry about it and be surprised at the end of the cruise when all of a sudden I get hit by a bill that's a lot more than I ever thought it would be. Yeah, I think a lot of a lot of people um, make the mistake, you know, because cruising has a reputation of having lots included, but every line has different things included. And, and particularly, and since post even post shutdown you know cruise lines are sort of even pulling back on stuff that's in, included and you know charging for more stuff but you're right the thing i always say to people is 
when comparing lines and comparing trips, you know, itineraries, sort of think about what am I going to pay from the time leaving home to the time getting back home? Because there's so much stuff in there that, um, you know, can be added. The big ones are gratuities, normally drinks, specialty dining, excursions. Those, those are the big ones. Um, and a lot of people don't realize, you know, things like, that, you know, a couple of hundred dollars, six hundred dollars could be added to your bill just for gratuities alone. So that's really, really important. And I'm a bit with you. Like, I, I mean, you could, I mean, there's different lines of doing different things. So you've got some lines which are bundling them now, like Princess, uh, Holland Americas. So you can buy them up front. But I'm, I'm a bit with you. I like, I like when you go on a cruise and you hardly ever have to show your cruise card, which acts as your kind of charge card um, during the cruise. So like on, I mean, I went on the most extreme example of that, my last cruise, Regent, where everything's included, drinks, special dining, excursions, everything. I mean, literally the only time I took my card out was to open my cabin door and <laughs> clocking in and off the ship, which right. has actually been replaced with facial recognition clocking right. on and off the ship anyway. Yeah, you had, a special, you had a special video about how that's a tracking mechanism. They know where you are all the time. Right, yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Worrying, but yeah. <laughs> exactly. You mentioned earlier about the first time you took the cruise and how now you understood why people love to do it. Can you expand a little bit on that? What was your initial reaction once the ship left the dock? This is your first cruise. What was the magic that then compelled you to continue that journey, which I th think it's great because uh, if you hit the right, if you pick the right ship and you pick the right itinerary and you pick the right destination, it's a wonderful experience. If you pick, as you said earlier, the wrong cabin and yeah. the wrong <laughs> ship, and all of a sudden you're on a party ship and you really wanted peace and quiet and intellectual discourse, yeah. that's going to be a disaster. So, yeah. so I guess it's a two-part question. Yeah. What was the I mean, love I mean, that you? What was that feeling that you had? And and uh, I'll just stick with that. What was the yeah. love? I mean, I think I think it was interesting because as the ship kind of, I was actually out of Southampton in the UK, and we were you sailed down the Solent, which is like a river, then out out, out to sea. And it and we, we you know ships generally sail sort of at sundown at like five six o'clock so the sun's coming down so it's all very beautiful kind of light and stuff and you just we were just sort of gliding down the river just and as we went out to see it, it just was really calm and quiet and peaceful and just the almost the silence of you know just push the ship kind of pushing through and it was just that sense of wow this is you know we're out at sea um, we're we're heading to somewhere new and exciting and it's there's also a sense of calm around it as well but then you know sort of within the ship there's just you can turn around get in the ship and there's everything going on you know casino and p parties and bars and shows and stuff i think it was that sort of like that dichotomy of like and i still do it now you know i love going out when we're selling at night and just walking on the deck because a sense of calm and peace and stuff but knowing then you can just step right back into everything it's, right. it's that, yeah it's, it's a in a way a controlled environment but you're looking out into nature so it's exactly. the best of both yeah. worlds, it seems. Yeah, yeah. I also am a balcony man, as you are. And I I learned, I mean, I, initially a couple of times that we went cruising, didn't have a balcony. We went to Alaska with a balcony. And that ever since then, we don't get a room without a balcony, even if it has to cost more. I know you agree, but can you explain to some of our listeners and viewers why that balcony is such a major difference in the experience? Yeah, I mean, I think it's and it's 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 kind of hard because there is, you know, as you said, there's there's a fairly big price difference between the, like the ocean view and the balcony, but there's something about you, you know the balcony. It also depends a bit on the itinerary, like you say, Alaska or wherever. But there's something about just being able to step out onto your balcony and you've got you know you're sailing with particularly when you're going into port, out of port, or sailing somewhere scenic. You're sitting out there and ordering room service, having breakfast out there, and it's just your own little kind of space. Um, and it's kind of a bit of escape. You know, if you've got a sea day, it's great to go and sit out there. And the pool deck might be quite busy. You can just go and sit there. But there's something about just stepping out into the fresh, you know, the sea air. Um, and also, it, it, you know, because if you have a balcony, you have floor to ceiling with glass. So you also just have much more light. And it just, it, it, to me, it's just, you feel like much more connected in, in some ways to the sea. Um, and it's interesting because, as you know, like, Ships um, like Celebrity, uh, some of the new Carnival, Mardi Gras ship and stuff, they've introduced these um, these infinite balconies where they basically got rid of the balcony and they have, which makes the camp bigger, which is the cell, 
and that is you know the, the, the top half slides down but people have got a very mixed on that because you're missing stepping out and just being in the sea air and it's interesting those are very divisive it's 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 um you know it, it shows you that the real difference between having a window that can open and a balcony i guess well that leads to my next question that i've been thinking about to asking you and i think this is the perfect time I was a little bit along of a preamble to simply just asking you the question, but occasionally I do. <laughs> <laughs> that is, what is the most favorable trend that's new for cruising and what's the most unfavorable trend? And that might be one of all, that's a mixed one that you just mentioned. But in other words, what's going on in the cruise line industry for passengers that is positive and what's going around in the cruise line industry for passengers that's not necessarily favorable? Um, let, let me do the second one first. So okay. I mean, I think probably at this point in time, uh, probably the most unfavorable thing is now that now that we sort of out of shutdown, cruise lines are back, you know, ships are getting full again. So that's, you know, I mean, we, we're used to having ships that are half, you know, I'm being used to sailing ships that are half full, getting back to, oh my God, these ships are full again, 100% capacity. But also what's happening is the cruise lines are trying to get their balance sheet and their profit and loss is kind of back in, in some sort of order. So there is kind of a tightening of, uh, if you're an existing cruiser, you're seeing, you know, things reduce. So for example, you know, Norwegian p and cruises in the UK, a few other lines, they've got rid of uh, evening turndown service, for example. Uh, they've reduced the number of cabin stewards. The, you know, there's, there's, up, there's some there's up charges on things that used to be included like lobster on some lines, or Carnival only has lobster on, on included if it's, Cruisers, certain nights. So there's kind of, you know, a squeeze and pressure on costs, uh, you, you, you know, and existing cruisers are really feeling that. What's interesting, though, is people new to cruise, which the cruise lines are now back aggressively chasing, they're loving cruising because they don't know that it's gone. If you don't know what I mean, like, for them, right. this is amazing. Right. Like, so much is included, all this entertainment's included, this, this is included, that's included. Whereas existing cruisers are unhappy, but new cruisers aren't, if you know what I mean, because they, exactly. it's not a good value thing. So that, that is that is a trend, and I guess that'll settle somewhere eventually. Um, I mean, I think on the so that's probably the biggest negative thing at, at this time, um, uh, or, or worst thing that's changed. Probably the the biggest positive I think is that cruising is evolving very fast and trying to cater for more and more type of people. You know, because the, you know when I first started cruising, it very much was kind of older married couples. Uh, that was who you know that who that's who cruising was for right. and it's it's evolved so much you know it's much more for families more solos you know it's more diverse you know um uh, there's so many different you know there's new cruise lines come along virgin are coming along you know then even fritz carlton are launching so there's all sorts of kind of segmentation i guess of using market but there's there's more choice for everybody you know different price levels and even on you know even if you look at like norwegian cruise lines you know which is sort of a traditionally a value line um you know relaxed cruising you know they've built the haven which i know alienates other people which so even if you but if you want that freestyle dining with the big production shows and huge amounts of choice you can still go in a beautiful suite as well uh you know you don't have to go in like a panama kind of thing but if you also want to go cheap you can go on that so so i think you know catering for so many more people is it's becoming much more accessible also Price-wise, it's becoming more accessible. You know, things like MSC, you can do an MSC cruise for very little money. Um, so, so that, I think, is a positive. Um, and there's a downside to that as well, because it means ships are getting bigger, because that makes them easy to run, and places get overrun and stuff. But those, to me, are the two big kind of, that would be the best and the worst things. I know in a lot of your videos and in your blog and in your podcast, you, can, you talk about tipping. And I'm curious about the concept of whether it's included in the bill or whether you do it afterwards, are there any cruisers that you've come across that do the opposite in this sense, not the opposite, but a supplement, that they tip in advance to the steward just to let them know that they appreciate their service and they're looking forward to a very enjoyable cruise? Some some people do. Some people, you know, some people argue that's the, you know, you do it up front with your cabin steward and you'll get kind of bet, better service. Um, I, I don't I, personally. I, d I don't do that, but because um, I prefer to like tip based on the service. If you know, tip on above above the auto gratuities, 
um, based, you know, based based on that. But people do, and people swear by. People also swear by, you know, um, tipping bomb, and which you don't have to because it does it auto to bad it to get better service. And I guess people are experimenting with that a bit more. Particularly, ships are getting fuller again, and there's lots of new crew and betting in because people talk about you know ships seem less well staffed but i think it may be a training issue or a staffing issue and they argue actually tipping up front the bomb and make sure that you get served quicker kind of stuff but people do do it i i don't know if it really works in practice have you ever encountered someone as we did who stays on the ship as a passenger and just continues the cruise whether it's a world cruise or some other kind of cruise but they have their own suite on the ship and they just stay on it and they keep going around, whether it's around the world or just back and forth, they're, they're just always there. Have you ever encountered I, one of those people? I, I've only once uh, encountered someone who, on uh, on the old Crystal, which of course went bankrupt. Well, they come, they are coming back. I did, uh, when I did a Crystal Cruise, because they had a couple of people who basically just stayed on, effectively li lived on. I did a video about people who do that uh, a bit, but I haven't met um, many of them, no. Um, I have met people though on who who do things like every year they do the world cruise um, and hardly get off the ship, which is even to take your point a bit further. I mean, they go on the world cruise every year. They're like, oh yeah, we've been to Hong Kong loads of times. You're not getting off. Like, oh, gosh, back in Hong Kong or whatever. It's like, surely you should be getting off. But there are people who like every year they, you know, boom, it's just three, four months of the year they're doing it every year. Yeah. Before I let you go, tell us a little bit about your your special aspect of your website where you can join as a member and you get additional benefits yeah it was something that i started ex experimenting with you know youtube because as i said i'm a bit geeky so when it, and also with things like youtube <laughs> if, if youtube ever does anything i will always experiment with it because they're doing it for a reason and they've tested the living daylights out of it and so they they introduced the memberships and there's also obviously a site called patreon which people may be familiar with where people can become patrons and i was a little bit coy about doing that but the idea is, is that um you, you know you get bonus content so so or and uh, or like um also now because things like with my live streams get loads and loads of people i can't get through all the questions so that is i do you know members only live streams where there'll be a much smaller group where we can connect and answer questions i've got various ebooks i do or specific videos i'll make around more behind the scenes stuff so I make videos around kind of cameras I use or how I deal with trolls or stuff like that. But also what I have um, is patron and member only uh, group cruises, which I'm experimenting with now. So to try and get a manageable size, a small kind of more intimate group, you know, maybe uh, going on cruises. So by becoming a member or patron, they, they can then book that cruise. Or when I do a bigger group cruise, they get your priority. So it's really about just kind of getting more access. And also the problem also, because I get obviously thousands of comments on the channel it's hard to keep up with them as, as a member i get flagged if a member ever leaves a comment so i can always get back to them really really quickly and the same on, on patreon so that's the idea is just kind of getting a bit more access and, and more kind of unique content last question because you alluded to it earlier you skipped over it a lot but it was significant your illness and your remission where do you get the energy to do all of this the the YouTube, the blog, and the podcast. Where does that energy come from now? Uh, since anybody has dealt with an illness, even if they they're in remission, you're still not as, and I assume not as not you personally, but one is not necessarily as energetic as in the past. Yeah, I mean, I think you to have bound, boundless energy. Yeah, I mean, I think I think um, that whole illness gave me a sense of uh, looking at time very differently. So, you know, I know we all talk about, oh, we don't know how long we've got, but then I had a real sense of, because there was, cut, you know, real touch and go. And I, was, and I was like, but there's so much I want to get done. There's so much I want to do, and I'm going to make sure I do it. Um, so I'm very driven because I, you know, because I'm in remission, I have no idea with the next year, the year after, or 10 years time. So I always have the sense of, I need to get it. I need to do things. So, and that's, that's where I get, kind of get the energy from. I think it's like, I'm just driven. And, and also, I'm very competitive with myself. Like, I always <laughs> want to do better. And so, just because, like, my partner would say, you're not very competitive. So, if it comes to a game, you know, playing Scrabble or something, I'm not very competitive. You know, I'll just, whatever. <laughs> but with myself, I'm very competitive. Like, I always want to, like, the video must be better than the last one. So, I think that also helps drive the energy. But I think it's mostly that sense of, you know, I keep thinking, well, 
I've got all this I want to do, but maybe I've got two years, maybe I've got three years, maybe I've got five years, maybe I've got 10 years, maybe I've got 20 years, but I, I want to get it done. So that's what I think that's where it comes from. I think the drive. Yeah. Well, that's a great way to leave it. My guest has been Gary Bebridge. He's host of Tips for Travelers, Incredible Cruise Experiences Made Easy, and it's available on his YouTube channel, blog, and podcast. And for everything about Gary, go to tipsfortravelers.com, and you can follow him on YouTube, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and Pinterest. And Gary, thanks for being on the show. Great, Ara. Thanks so much. It was, it was really good. Thank you. Thank you. And join us every Thursday for a new schmear on Ira's Everything Bagel.